Zach with Wingard Wearables. You're one of 12 special people who's going to watch this video to the end. In today's video, we're talking about how Wingard Wearables uses 3D printing for our design processes. Now, if you uh, are a big knife enthusiast, lots of knife makers uh, design fixed blade knives either on paper or by cutting them out of cardboard or cardstock. That works great. Uh, but when you start working with 3D designs, like our ergonomic uh, wearable tomahawks, when you have that third dimension, whether it's the tomahawk eye or the offset spike, that sort of thing, that's where 3D printing can really elevate the insights you get on a design and hone in and finalize it before it becomes a final product. And so we're just going to walk through the back ripper tomahawk, the stingray tomahawk, the empress tomahawk, the micro pike multi-tool, and a product that will never exist because we went through the 3D printing uh, process. So stay tuned, enjoy, and be edgy. So for our back ripper tomahawks, these didn't start out as a refined three-dimensional concept. Uh, it actually started out with a simple drawing, many, many drawings actually, uh, and we finally homed in on what we thought the final drawing would be. I then uh, modeled it up in a CAD CAM program and got it 3D printed. And uh, this is what the Tomahawk head looked like. The handle would be dead center. Uh, there was no uh, cant to it. Um, and there was no bend to the Tomahawk head. And what I found out was when this got 3D printed and I mounted it to a wooden handle, when I put that in my pants, uh, my beer belly was running into the top edge of this head when this was inside the waistband. Uh, when I would bend deeply at the waist, the beer belly would contact this. Also, when I would attempt to sit down, uh, this would make contact onto the sitting surface because the curvature of the waistline goes this way and there's a gap. This is protruding. And uh, 3D printed plastics being delicate, it actually had enough force to break this. Um, we 3D printed a couple of these. Um, so the next iteration we took was curving the hook and canting the head. And this is what uh, I came up with on the next iteration. Um, it has a curved spike and the eye geometry was actually shrunken down um, because I wanted just minimal weight, minimize the weight of the Tomahawk head. And consulting with my mentor, who's since passed away, Jack Vargo, um, he showed me examples of historic spike Tomahawks where, you know, the amount of uh, wood in the eye, you know, when you have a strong enough grain of wood, like for hickory or a hop hornbeam, it could be smaller than your index finger. Uh, so I really uh, kind of took the eye geometry down to an extreme. And uh, at the time, I wanted a sort of protruding clip to clip into uh, the waistband directly on the tomahawk head. Um, and so you, know, you can see sort of the radical changes there. Canted head, canted spike, and... We actually were able to take this to a blacksmith in West Virginia, and he took a crack at it. And he could not forge the clip. Instead, he did a, you know, a protruding sort of set screw, which also doubled to hold the head into place. Um, there was so little hickory in this that he and I didn't feel comfortable wedging it. Um, and that was the first functional back ripper tomahawk head. And I could instantly tell there needed to be some changes. This was hideous. It also didn't really work to catch on the pants. I realized I needed to have a carry system made for this. Um, and even though uh, this amount of hickory turned out to be strong enough, plenty strong for chops, it just visually did not look strong. So customers uh, would probably be deterred from buying a tomahawk that had this tiny amount of wood in the eye. So we then progressed the design to this. So this was 3D printed. Uh, the comparison between these two, the uh, eye geometry is substantially increased. We still have the canted uh, spike 
and the downward canted uh, axe blade. So that was useful not only uh, to tell, yes, this is, seems to be markedly improved. You, know, you can test the carry ergonomics with a 3D printed plastic, but you know, the blacksmith can use this as a point of reference for this that he made, which is like just really impressive how close he got to the real deal. Um, you know, excellent job. Uh, so he had the cant, angled downward head, the canted spike, very ergonomic to carry. And it also looked pretty darn good. And this is what convinced us that the back ripper Tomahawk could become a product. Now, there were some other changes that were made, um, but we eventually settled on what the design looks like today. Um, and uh, yeah, these are how the back rippers come now. Um, but that level of design progression really was assisted big time with 3D printing, especially, uh, you know, taking a drawing and getting it into a three-dimensional form and then testing the carry ergonomics. I mean, there is a really big difference between where we started and where we ended up. Um, so very, very useful uh, 3D printing as a design process for the back ripper. Um, so yeah, on to the next. We'll go to the Empress. All right, so the Empress Tomahawk was our uh, modern take on an everyday carry spontoon tomahawk. And one of the things I noticed people say before we tackle this project, they would look at these historic spontoon tomahawks, just side profile pictures of them, never holding them, and just say, hey, these things will just get stuck if you hit somebody. That blade's just going to sink in there. It's going to get stuck in there. And uh, maybe that's why these curls were there. Um, and so when we were tackling a modern version of the Spontoon Tomahawk, we really wanted to make sure that front uh, piercing blade could easily penetrate and extract out of soft tissues. And so we used 3D printing to experiment with that because we did not really have this specific design in mind, we had a series of designs, and I'll show them to you right now. So we had 3D printed, for experimental purposes, little Empress Tomahawk heads out of uh, strong ABS plastic. So let me lay these out for you here. And you'll see some of them are, like, pretty ugly. Um, so this is what is, is closest to the Empress Tomahawk today. It's rounded on one side, flat on the other, all right? But we had other concepts that were basically rounded on both sides or flat on both sides. And we even had these concepts where it was sort of beveled, like um, almost like a giant push dagger. Um, so you had these big bevels on it. And we even did like an asymmetric version of it where it's flat on one side and has these two big bevels. And the purpose of getting all these small scale versions made is uh, I could take a piece of polystyrene, like two inch thick polystyrene, and just shove these in by hand. And the polystyrene would get split into just like flesh and bone, even though these heads were plastic. And I could slide these in and feel with my finger pressure how difficult that was to pierce and then feel with my finger pressure how difficult it was to extract each one of these uh, front piercing blade concepts. And what we found out was uh, the concepts that had these angled bevels would really uh, get stuck. They had extraction problems. It was like the uh, edges would bite in and bind. And so these were bad for extraction. Um, and I believe, if I remember correctly, this one was also bad for extraction. It's sort of bound too. And then it came down to the double rounded on both sides concept, which had a bit more resistance to penetration, but extracted very easily. And then the concept we wound up going with, which was rounded on one side, flat on the other. So, you know, using small scale 3D uh, printed heads, I was able to hone in on a couple of designs that seemed to work. So we then took those two and scaled them up to uh, life size, right? 
we weren't quite sure on the final dimensions. So we had, we were really leaning heavily on the double rounded concept where the front flat piercing spike was actually rounded on both sides. You see here, these two have identical um, eye geometries and rear curved talon blades, uh, but the front projecting uh, spike was longer on this one and shorter on this one. And we found just by making these life size, um, I could hone in on the carry ergonomics. Uh, this protruding out as far as it did kind of got it printed more in concealment and also uh, by protruding more. It could nick you if you had if you were fatter than I was. If you had a really big beer gut, uh, even though this was downward canted, it could it could nick you some. Um, versus it being shorter, it was more out of the way. Um, and so our final we went with was this, where it was flat, like the Megalodon shark tooth, flat on one side, rounded spike on the other. And that's what we wound up ultimately going with uh, for our final head design. You can see it's, it's really a close match uh, to the 3D printed uh, prototype. Um, there's a little bit of shrinkage when you uh, cast in bronze, um, but you know that's what we went with. Um, and so that 3D printing process was useful, not just on refining uh, the carry ergonomics, but also the performance to estimate you know, which front piercing spike geometry was gonna be the best. So that's how we use 3D printing uh, to help hone in on the Empress Tomahawk design. Now for our Stingray Tomahawks, this started also with a 3D printed uh, design and the eye geometry was substantially thinner than what we went with with the final design. Um, there were no chamfers on the spike, um, and it was quite thick on the chopping blade, quite steep. And the mass was higher than I wanted. Uh, I knew, I think this was uh, maybe over eight ounces, I think, for the... Uh, mass estimation based on the solid model. Um, and we wanted to go thinner and lighter than that. So on the next 3D printing, and now this has a little misprint on it, but we went substantially uh, thinner in the chopping blade. Um, and we also added uh, chamfers on the corners of the spike, which not only reduced weight, but aided in extraction. Now I have a more refined uh, version of this 3D printed uh, prototype. It's with the blacksmith, um, but he was able to take this along with drawings and make this prototype out of uh, tool steel. And we learned several things from this. So that 3D printed uh, prototype, he got pretty close to matching it, but found it to be extraordinarily difficult to uh, forge this, to move the metal where it flares out this much here and here, extremely difficult to do. Um, also, when we were testing this prototype, the thinness of the eye, um, it was like overstressing the wood. This is a, you know, a tomahawk intended to throw, say at wood targets, if you're practicing throwing. Um, and there was just a lot of stress on the eye um, part of that's the fact that it had a 16 inch long hickory handle on it, so it sunk into the wood. This still wanted to spin, so there was a lot of vibration and moment arm. So we knew, based on this prototype, that we needed to thicken that eye. And we went with another 3D printing. This, look how much bigger the eye geometry is. Um, and the spike is uh, also wider. Um, that was, you know, we knew at this point we were going to have to go with a cast head because it, this geometry was too complex to hand forge. Um, and based on feedback with the foundry, they recommended uh, widening the spike some. Um, and we also, when we got this in hand and we're looking at it, we saw just this big increase in surface area on the inside of the eye. And, uh, you know, doing my patent reviews, I found uh, a grooved tomhawk eye patent where there are grooves running on the, uh, like, teeth running on the inside of the eye to help bite into wood when you wedge it. And so uh, since this was getting cast, I decided, hey, let's just go ahead and leverage that, that process in the Stingray Tomhawk. 
And so having this 3D printing in hand, which is very close uh, to final dimensions of uh, the, Sting, the final Stingray Tomahawk prototype, um, really handy to get these in hand and just hold it, look at it. Your brain just starts thinking of uh, different ways to maximize the potential of a design, even though it's just in fragile plastic in your hands. Uh, it is just so useful having this as a design tool to rapidly iterate on a design and mature it into the product. So, yeah, that's how we used 3D printing with uh, the Stingray Tomahawk. Now, on the MicroPike multi-tool, that concept was, can you get a short blade on a long streamlined handle that's curved to conform to your body? Nothing like that exists commercially. It was just a, an idea. And so I knew I could use 3D printing to sprint on that. And you start with doing the bad version first. And this is the bad version of the MicroPipe multi-tool. Uh, this was so long that it could not be fitted in the 3D printer in one go. So this is actually a two-piece assembly that clicks together and was epoxied. Um, but this was the general idea. We have a curved section that would conform to the body and then a long streamlined section and then a blade. And it was just notional. I knew this wasn't what it was going to wind up being, but I knew if I could get this in hand and hold it up against my body, I could get to the better version faster. So this was the bad version, held it up against my waistline. Uh, it mismatched the curve significantly. So then we made the next one. So this was again a two-piece design um, and you can see the curve is a lot different. I was actually able to hold this one until not only was the curve off but I could have increased the length of the item by a couple of inches and still conform to the body. And then this was the final 3D printout um, and you can see just the rapid progression. And this does go right up against your waistline, like along your belt line. Uh, oh yeah, it matches perfect. And it's quite significant in size. So I was able to take this 3D printout and, um, you know, test the ergonomics and test, you know, the potential grips and, and that sort of thing. And then uh, take it to the blacksmith to make the first prototype. And this was it. Um, it didn't perfectly match the curvature, but it was close. Um, and the flared out section for the handle needed to be thought through more. We knew it was like, hey, this isn't the perfect solution, but this is a way to get started. Um, and then from there, we were able to iterate in the uh, this version, which has like a thumb pad and is actually a little bit longer and also conforms to the body. Um, so again, 3D printing, just like what a huge difference that made in, in coming up with the idea, sketching it out on paper, getting it on a computer, getting it 3D printed, and then just being able to hold it in your hands, hold it against your body, iron out the carry ergonomics, uh, work directly uh, with a talented blacksmith to hone in and refine it. Um, this is... Uh, what a MicroPike multi-tool looks like without the grip, the leather loom grip on it. Um, but yeah, fantastic how useful this tool was on sprinting um, because it is a, a three-dimensional design. Uh, cardstock wouldn't have done this justice. Um, so this was just really useful. Now, you may be wondering, how do I get a MicroPike multi-tool? You guys haven't made those in a while. And that's true. We have this discontinued the MicroPike because we are designing a new one, um, a new generation of it, but we'll get into that more on a later video at a later time. Now, the last thing I want to go over with 3D printing and how useful it can be um, is how useful it can be to tell you not to do something. Uh, I'm holding in my hands right now a Todd Cutler uh, mace. Um, it's a lost wax cast brass and it's attached to a handle I made and I used a dark patina and even used brass uh, screws so I could patina the whole thing. Really cool. 
I like this, uh, but I want it to be lighter and EDC friendly um, and of our own little unique design. Um, so we use 3D printing to explore different mace heads. And we started with something like this. This is a uh, very similar to a historic medieval pattern. Um, and you'll notice if you can see in there, I tried to hollow out sections because one of the things that's actually critical with a mace that's not hitting armor or heavy armor is how light they actually were. Uh, they would really try to uh, hollow out um, sort of these pyramidal sections uh, to reduce weight um, because you really need a lot of speed and the contact pressure of these knobs hitting very significant. Um, so anyways, that was the first 3D printed uh, design I had. It was based on more of a historical piece. Um, then I went with this ugly guy, which was an attempt at radical uh, weight reduction. <laughs> it was like you kept these uh, central pyramidal posts, but they were skinnied up. They were actually hollow ground. See that? Or sort of a pseudo hollow grind. And then, um, you know, instead of pyramids, it was sort of spikes coming off. And it was very thin. It didn't require any hollow outs because of how thinned out it was. But it's also, well, you look at it, it's, it's quite ugly. All right. Then we got this guy. It was sort of the beefed up version of this. So I got the uh, pyramids in the center. And then these uh, sort of bulbous spike cones coming off. Um, and it kind of looks, you know, from the top view, like a, you know, like a flower. It's actually kind of pretty. Um, and these also had hollowed out cavities inside, which is hard to see because um, it's black on black. But yeah, there are voids inside these pyramids to lighten it up. And that progressed to this design, which has conical spikes on top and pyramidal spikes on the center. And very pretty, by the way. Imagine how pretty this would be out of uh, bronze. And then finally, this design. It's more of a flare out of this. So instead of this being so flat, I flared out the spikes more. And I just thought this was really cool. It didn't even have like a, a flat interface. You can see it's got like sort of humps where it would bite into the wood when you wedged it. Um, so I thought these were just... Uh, Really cool, um, and you might be wondering how on earth would you EDC a mace comfortably? Uh, I found uh, that by having a, a, a tough leather pad up against your body, uh, the, between your body and the knobs, you really didn't feel the knobs at all. Of course, these could catch on things, so this wasn't really the most practical idea, and it became even more impractical when I started engaging with uh, bronze foundries uh, local to us. And I was able to bring these 3D printed uh, prototypes in hand and immediately get feedback that showed that none of these designs could be made uh, economically. Like sand casting, not even possible with sort of the uh, complex geometry where these are just, you'd have to get the sand mold through so many complex little corners and creases and plus the voids in the middle. So the, really the only way to do these designs would be lost wax casting. And uh, we got a quote for molds, thousands and thousands of dollars just for a mold to start these and easily hundreds of dollars per a mace head. And it's like, well, you know, here you got this, which uh, I think Todd Cutler is getting these made in China and they're selling them for, I don't know, 40 to 80 bucks. Um, yeah, scale. He's definitely selling a lot of these versus our small boutique business here. You know, we're just really not going to be spending thousands and thousands of dollars to get a super niche product line out there that is at a price point that's just absurd, right? So, you know, going through this design process and getting these 3D printed, you might look at that and be like, oh, look all this effort you guys spent on this and it didn't go anywhere. Well, that may be true, but what it also did is it helped us know that this concept is not something that we're going to be doing. 
probably ever um, because of just the complexity of, of pulling off these visually eye appealing uh, but quite expensive to make designs. So hope that makes sense. Um, yeah. Anyway, check out Todd Cutler for some cool maces. So sadly, there probably is not going to be an everyday carry wearable mace uh, from Wingar Wearables in the near future. Uh, but the Micropike is coming back sometime in the months to many months ahead. We do have a Micropike Gen 2 concept. It's very exciting. We will share it later when we get closer uh, through the prototype process. And if you're looking for something wearable from Wingar Wearables and you want to support us, for under $25, you can get this fine t-shirt. It's excellent. Look at it. It's a dick pic penetrating a man, some bodily fluids. It's the most G-rated version of uh, showing that on a t-shirt that you can get. It's made by hardworking Hondurans and printed at a uh, shop out in Delaware that's nearby. Uh, so I have verified the fabric, very tender nipples, very soft on the nipples. I messed that one up. We're going to do this one over again. What? <laughs> so sadly, there will probably not be a wearable everyday carry mace coming from Wingar Wearables in the near future. Uh, but the Micropike is coming back in the months to many months ahead. Uh, we have a Micropike Gen 2 concept. Uh, in drawing form, we're going to have to take it through that 3D printed process and then, uh, you know, water jet cut metal and blacksmith. Um, so we'll keep you guys updated as that progresses. Uh, and if you are looking for something wearable from Wingard Wearables and you want to support us for under $25, we've got these t-shirts. Very tasteful. Look at that. We got a dick pic penetrating a man, some bodily fluids. This was actually based on a self-defense incident that occurred from one of our customers. So, um, yeah, invest in a very comfortable shirt. It's very soft on the nipples. And uh, also, share this video with a friend so that 13 people will have watched it. And remember, to be edgy!